Welcome to the NY Patriot Show. Thank you all for hitting that play button. Uh, if you're a returning listener, that's what's up. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming back and checking out this show. Uh, if you can, if you like this one, hit that like button and hit that share button. Pass it on. There's no commercials and there's no paywall. So all I ask for is to share the show. If this is your uh, first time listening, uh, I do have other true crime on here. Uh, and you may actually like some of the other things that I have covered in the past. So uh, hit that sub button in case you forget later on. And check out the other shows and uh, some of the other amazing guests that I have had on. Uh, as you can see in the title, this is uh, going to be some weird true crime. And I have mentioned on my show. I mean, and I have had Roberta Glass on. Me and Teresa have even covered some weird true crime that we even thought was like maybe like the Matrix replicating itself into reality or something weird. Or some kind of occultism behind it. And, you know, I've had, you know, Roberta Glass on, like I've mentioned, cover Damien Eccles. But uh, I do enjoy true crime myself. And uh, I guess, unfortunately, since you're not paying to listen to this show and this is my podcast, I can cover whatever I like. So <laughs> you're getting true crime for free if you like it or not. If you don't like it, you didn't hit the play button. So, uh, yeah, I got uh, Nick's back on. If you haven't heard her before, I have had her on my show one at a time. I think this is uh, like her debut for podcasting and the only show she's been on. So if you want to, uh, I highly suggest to check that out. That was on the Balenciaga. Um, you know, a topic that was very weird. Actually, me, all three of us actually right here had talked about covering that before in the past. But I think it got like so elaborate. With certain things, me and Teresa were just like, <laughs> I don't know. And then, like, you know, it was only a hot topic anyway. So it kind of passed, and, uh, you know, Nick was still like, you know, did you still want to cover that? And I was like, you know what, I'll have you on anyway. And uh, that was actually a very interesting episode. Uh, she did point out some very interesting stuff for sure and did even touch on some of the topics that we all thought was a little iffy. Um, go back and check out that episode. And then come back and check out this one. It's going to be a little bit different than what she covered last time. This is uh, more of true crime, I guess, instead of conspiracy. But a little bit of conspiracy with the true crime. Um, so, yeah. So, first, Nix, I'll shut up and I'll let you introduce yourself and plug your Instagram. Yes, um, I'm Nix. Thanks for having me back. And my Instagram account is Nix, and that's N-Y-X, period, one, two, two, three. Very well, and I will put your link in the bottom for everybody to find. And Teresa, would you love to plug your show as well? <laughs> well, yes, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, yeah, so people can also find me on the Spiritual Gangsters, which is another show that we have together, and uh, it's very different. It talks about, like, personal stories of transformation and awakening. It's a good time, so check it out on uh, all the major podcast platforms, and you can find me. Also on Instagram, just my name, at Teresa.Kassar. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. And the links for her, her her show is also in my link tree because I do co-host it with her. So all the links are in there. Um, there is a bit shoot. I, I'm going to try to get some of the videos loaded up. Um, if there's topics that we cover that are available on the podcast but not on YouTube, obviously you know why, because of the censorship. But it will be available on bit shoot. And she's had a few of those already, so I figured it might be worth throwing up on BitChute, too. So, uh, yeah, definitely check that out soon. And I also do want to add, uh, just for something on my own show, it's something that I've kind of been doing. I don't know if anybody's even caught on to it. But, like, going forward in the future, if you see, like, the NY Patriot show, that is with her as my co-host. And then the topic will be whatever, or the guest will be whatever. So if you do see in podcasts or on the videos, it's NY Patriot Show. It's automatically her as my co-host with somebody as a top with a guest covering a topic or it's us 
doing it. So it's just a way, like, in case you happen to like her better than me, when you see the NY Patriots show, you know to hit that one because she's going to be talking. Ha, ha, ha. You never know. You know, there could be people who listen to my know. show now because of you and not because of me. So. Uh-huh. You have no idea. It could be fans it's from your true. show, right? It could be fans That's from the true. Spiritual Gangsters. <laughs> Cross-contamination. So, yes, okay. exactly. So that, that was just a thing I've been doing. Uh, the NY Patriots show was when I have her as a co-host, so. Something different. Uh, all right, so Nick's back to you. Back to the true crime. I don't know which one you want to start with first. Either one of them, both very, very interesting to me. I don't know if you want to give a short rundown of both of them or whatever and then go into one. It's up to you. Um, so I'm going to be covering a modern day case that had um, occult undertones to it and then one from um, history. So, but I figured I'd start with the modern day one first. And um, that's the murders of uh, Howard Green and Carol Marin. And this happened on December 16th, 1979. Um, the two of them both were from uh, Brooklyn, New York. They lived together. And on December 16th, 1979, the bodies were dumped and found in West Patterson, New Jersey, on the shoulder of Route 80. Now, when I investigated this case, there are some um, variations and discrepancies. Um, so one said that uh, the bodies were found by a boy walking his dog. There's some other accounts that say by a passing motorist. But um, they were wrapped up in carpet, and they were bludgeoned so badly, their eyes blew out of their sockets, um, said a retired detective by the name of James Devereaux. Devereaux. Yeah. Um, Oh, not not to jump ahead real quick. So for all I know, you could be mentioning this. Um, But like, as soon as you mentioned like rolled up in carpet, I'm like thinking these people were like... Yeah, like canvas and rugs. Yeah, yeah, or like killed somewhere else, like in a place that they knew they were going to be killed in. Like it was like, you know, like a room Mm -hmm. that we knew, you know, you do whatever Mm -hmm. you did, roll them up and take them out. I don't know if maybe mm-hmm. they get to that eventually within your notes. Well, but. it doesn't look like they were killed there, and I'll, I'll get to that in a okay. second. So right. I did forget to mention um, Howard Green. I've seen some variations of his age, but um, the general consensus seemed to be 51, and Carol Marin was 33. Oh, 33. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah. some other accounts stated that the two had been beaten on the left side of their face. And stabbed in the right eye, which I found kind of interesting. Um, the left side of their face, you know, the left-hand path. And then I started thinking about well, what's the what's the right eye? Was there any you know reason for that? What's what's the sim- symbolism beyond that? And um, the right eyes um, in the occult world, or at least um, in Egyptian and Western occult traditions, um, is associated with the eye of Ra. Um, the solar sun and um, the eye of Ra, or is also known the eye of truth, a force that uses um, violence to subdue and control enemies for protection. Um, but the eye in the cult world has a lot of symbolism behind it. In nearly all cultures, the eye is associated with spiritual concepts such as divinity, eye of providence, spiritual illumination. Um, the third eye being the penal gland or the magic evil eye. So I just found it interesting how this account said that the right eye was stabbed out and the left side of the face was beaten. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, <clears throat> I can see that possibly being, I hate to say it, a, a cult sim- symbolism. That's mm-hmm. what I think. I'm yeah. especially with like, are you, like, I'm just thinking like when you say somebody's left eye beaten, I'm thinking mm-hmm. bruised. Regal, mm-hmm. I'm sure it looked a lot worse mm-hmm. than that. Mm-hmm. But uh, so then, like, you would think of, like, the left eye is kind of black, going along with the black pillar. The right mm-hmm. eye stabbed. I, I have said repeatedly, and it's even something I'm going to be covering in From Hell. I'm going to be covering from uh, in Hell, the Jack the Ripper case. There's times when they're showing blades, and the person that's kind of holding the blade is already playing Janice, in my opinion. Just like mm-hmm. when I covered... Um, the, the, with the beasts of horror, when I did Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger, there's a lot of Janus symbolism and a blade or a straight line and can be used as a symbol for Janus. And that is more on the right pillar, this top, top sphere of the pillar. 
is Janus on Chokma. You know, so like you're getting a lot of like, uh, I could see the similarities of the eye and the head and the pillars in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the straight line, the stabbing of the right side. You know, you get yeah. Freddy Krueger, he's got all these blades. Even the cross is like a symbol for uh, Chokma, which could be a knife if you're holding it in your hand. You know, in a sense, mm -hmm. like there was even like in Masters of Horror when the uh, the girl was going downstairs into Freddy Krueger's thing, and she sees like a knife on a on a blanket and then moves it over and then there's a cross next to it too. I was just mm -hmm. like, you know, this is all fucking, you know, well, it, she's got all these pipes around there with all this air pressure rising up, all this, you know, steam. You know, it's quite obvious to me it was you know Janice symbolism. Yeah, you know, and he's trying to kill her. That's the whole thing, chasing this chick. <laughs> You know when like you see um, those images of like politicians and celebrities with their eye beat up, mm -hmm. I think it's usually the left one. Mm -hmm. But uh, like go with like beating the left side of the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's weird, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition, um, the tips of their ears were cut off, and their blood was drained um, through oh. approximately thirty puncture wounds made in identical places on each of their bodies. What? Yeah. See, like even more stuff like that that makes me think of like. You know, again, like silence, maybe just snipping ears is like a sign of that. You mm -hmm. know, going into the abyss, you go, you know, some people call it like silence. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I do find that weird that like some people do do that to uh, dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, is that like, yeah. is that like I a think reference even back in to like a hellhound, cropping their ears. hellhound or I something? I think in the Bible, something about adultery, I think they talk about like cutting ears and noses or something uh -huh. like that. Oh, really? Um, but um, so it's been speculated that a veterinarian syringe was used for this, and there was no blood um, spatter at the crime scene, so um, it doesn't look like they were murdered there, that they, they were murdered somewhere else. Mm. And then um, another interesting detail was that in each victim's hand, there was a clump of hair, and they never were able to identify um, who the hair belonged to. Mm, so, and a weird. lot of, there was a lot of, um, you know, talk that that was either satanic or cult related, um, oh, that, that was so just, amazing. you know, symbolized That's that. Mm. So, um, Odd. yes. Did they very. mention what color the hair was? Was it, the, were they both holding they, like the same hair? But you know it, uh, it sounds like it was, yeah, the same hair, but it didn't say, I don't believe it said what uh, color. And like, was it like ripped out or just like? snipped and placed in their hand didn't say that it just said a clump okay. so when i guess they say a clump that makes me think maybe ripped, ripped. out but yeah like I if mean, they were could, fighting back you know right what I mean? like right so okay. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so it didn't it didn't specify in that but it, i from what it sounds like it was more like you know something pulled out sound like you've watched investigation discovery just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit you watch that stuff expert. huh do you watch that stuff? I know you do. Uh, oh yeah. Next, do you watch that stuff, Teresa? No, uh, I also okay. don't. I don't think we get that channel. Oh okay. I was yeah. I was actually wondering. Do you even get that over in Canada? I probably have to pay extra for it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Us Canadian low budget over here. Oh, no, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't consider that really a high quality channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, like our TV servers, we don't get like all the bells and whistles. Maybe like as in like a basic American package. I would say. Gotcha. Uh, mm. Um, all right, so go but, ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's all right. <laughs> I forgot to mention that um, Howard Green was a taxi driver and artist, while Karen Marin was a secretary at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and a part-time dress designer. Um, like, as I said earlier, they both resided in Brooklyn, New York. Um, not a whole lot is out there about this case, and there's some variations of the investigation reported, which I touched on. So, um, but the New York Post um, published an article um, on March 3rd, 2002, titled Hellish 79 Slay Goes Cold After Cops Drop the Ball. So I'm just going to um, briefly read over part of that article real quick um, so you can get an idea of how the police um, kind of really botched this, whether it was intentionally or unintentionally, I'm not sure. Um, but it says, a post-investigation into the double homicide found not only that the trail to the brutal killer has gone cold, but it may never have been followed properly. 
retired detectives from Brooklyn's 88th precinct, 88, mm-hmm. and the West Patterson Police Department, along with the, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, Passiac County Prosecutor's Office. You said it close enough. Confirmed, <laughs> confirmed they all thought the others had done the follow-up inve- investigation. And I'm thinking, don't you guys communicate, like, you know, when you're doing that? Like, hey, have you found anything? Or share, like, you know, so I really don't understand how they just assumed the other one was going to do it all when this clearly is two jurisdictions and requires two, you know, investigative authorities to be looking into this. You know what I find um, interesting <laughs> already that you said uh, now, and, and I guess, like, maybe the listeners may have no idea why, like, I'm already looking at this in an occult aspect. They'll figure out, I guess, eventually. But uh, you you mentioned the, this body was found on, what, Route 80? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, something again. Now with the eights. They need 88th precinct, uh, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. You're getting a lot of eights here. Mm-hmm. Well, both their ages added to six, the two victims. Oh, yeah. 61 and 33. Weird. So, um, technically, Jersey's got the responsibility to follow up, said retired Brooklyn detective James Devereaux. He says he assisted the original investigation of the Brooklyn couple's murder as a courtesy to the Passiac prosecutor. But retired West Patterson detective Thomas Hemsey said the investigation was left in New York where the murders probably occurred. Devereaux was supposed to keep following up on it if any new information came, Hemsey said. Captain Ed Murphy, Murphy of the Passaic prosecutor's office also put the burden on New York and was surprised to learn the case was unsolved. A New York police spokesman, Walter Burns, said the Brooklyn cold case squad is not currently working on the case. The post-investigation also found startling inconsistencies in the investigators' recollections of their work. Devereaux said he twice interviewed a resident of the victim's neighborhood who he reported admitting to having drained the blood of mice he kept. He said he wanted to impress his girlfriend at the time, Devereaux recalled. Who the hell thinks that's going to impress... (laughs) So, like, like that's gonna get you a girlfriend like well, what I, kind of girlfriend do you have bro like <laughs> like I, I just like was looking at that i'm like yeah i don't think that's gonna be what's gonna win a woman over but um some weird people out there <laughs> um especially the when you start getting into some of the people and you know what they were involved with here i mean i wouldn't put it past any of the people i've met like <laughs> <laughs> The man who now lives out of state dismissed Devereaux's recollection and says he never met the detective. Hell no, I never said that stuff, he said, adding he was on a hitchhiking holiday in Texas at the time of the murders. Devereaux said he thought the murders were part of a ritual because he recalled satanic paraphernalia being found inside the victim's apartment at 280 DeCobb Avenue in downtown Brooklyn. He said the apartment was in disarray and drenched in blood as if a struggle had occurred there. But retired West Patterson detective Joseph Lambert said the apartment was neat and clean with no signs of devil worship. Lambert said the building's landlord, Jonathan Nelson, wanted Green's apartment for his terminally ill father because Green was paying peanuts in rent each month. He said Nelson had taken Green to court over it. Nelson confirmed to the Post that he had written, or I'm sorry, he had wanted the apartment for his father because it was on the ground floor and easily accessible. He said he had nothing against Green and Marin and had been interviewed by police at the time. Um, so you can see there are tons of inconsistencies already. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. It's like, you know, the, well, either the police department knows what the other one is doing, they're just assuming. Um, and then, like, how they found the apartment, there's discrepancies and variations of that story, you know. Um You got one saying, like, the apartment was neat and tidy, no signs of, like, satanic or occult paraphernalia. Um, And then you have James Devereaux and, um, I'm sorry, Captain Edward Murphy at the Pasek Prosecutor's (laughs) Office saying, you know, that looks like where the crime occurred, there's blood all over, so which is it? Hmm. Yeah, Uh, that's weird. Well, then, does that make you think, Nick, that one police department was involved and they're trying to like cover it up or uh there could be a possibility with that or they just really like botched it up and they both departments really uh dropped the ball like i don't understand like like i don't even know like what's truth or fact in this because there are variations to the story so but something 
I mean, this is embarrassingly like, <clears throat> terrible if, like, they drop the ball on this. Um, well, you, you, know know. What's, you know what I did want to bring up, too? I was going to wait a little bit longer, but maybe I'll add it to this. Um, you mentioned how the body's found in Jersey, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the Ciceros are out in Jersey, and the Ciceros are associated with the Golden Dawn. And, you know, they also associate with people from the OTO because, they're, you know, whatever, intermingling. So you're going forward. I'm just wondering, like, you know, was there some coordinated efforts among different groups with this? Well, that's the thing. No one really knows. Well, and the Ciceros um, are actually mafia as well. mm -hmm. So, you know, and then you're talking about Jersey. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. um, A little further down here, I'm going to get involved or kind of touch on, you know, what they were involved with or potentially involved with and what people were thinking, um, who, who was behind it or who potentially was behind it. But um, I was just going to read this one other article that was um, not long after the first one. The, the first one was in March. This one was in April, April 8th of 2002. And it says a missing case file uh, in its title, Cold, Cold Case Cop Loses 79 Slay File. A missing case file has stalled a reexamination of evidence in the unsolved grisly murder of a Brooklyn couple more than 20 years ago. Three weeks ago, the Post reported that Brooklyn Cold Case Squad was going to assign a detective to review evidence in the case. But Sergeant Dennis Bottle now says Brooklyn's 88th precinct can't find the case. You can't find a cold case, a case that wasn't solved. He lost that. Don't you think that's something, you know, you kind of keep around until it was solved? Yeah. Um, the case went cold amid confusion among detectives from the 88th, from the 88th precinct and New York or I'm sorry, New Jersey's West Patterson Police Department and the Passaic County Prosecutor's Office as to who should have followed up on the original investigation. Um, and then it says that Sergeant Dennis Bottle said it was treated as a missing persons case in New York where Green and Marin lived and a homicide case in New Jersey where the victims were found. But Captain Edward Murphy of the Passaic Prosecutor's Office said Jersey detectives collected evidence at the time that determined the murders occurred inside Green and Marin's Brooklyn apartment. So, again, like, well, two investigators are saying that it did occur in the apartment, and then another one's saying it didn't. So, so the people in Jersey you know, are I don't actually even know. saying that it happened in Brooklyn. And then what are the um, Brooklyn people saying that it happened So one, um, one detective in Jersey said uh, the apartment looked fine. And another one um, from the prosecutor's office in Jersey said um, there was evidence that suggested that it occurred in the apartment. And then there was the um, James Devereaux, the detective from Brooklyn, who said the apartment was covered in blood and disarray and satanic paraphernalia around. Yeah, three so, different people actually saying three different things. Yeah. So it's really, oh, really hard to know what... I mean, two of them are both kind of saying the same mm-hmm. thing, but this guy's mm-hmm. going a little bit more detailed with... Yeah, and then just, I mean, the fact that it's really hard to know what actually happened if, like, not everyone has the same consensus on, you know, what happened or what oh, was yeah. found. So, um, but it was it was definitely a case of piss-poor communication, and for Brooklyn to lose the, the file, that's just, that's just really odd. And I don't know exactly, um, I'll mention Maury Terry. Well, you know, you have, to think, you have to think real quick. I mean, because you were saying, like, you know, is the communication real bad? It had to have been for serial killers to be cross-country. And mm-hmm. we had a lot of them back in the 70s and 80s. I don't mm-hmm. think they actually, I mean, nowhere close to the technology or the way of communicating they do now. There were mm-hmm. times where it's like, I think they knew, like, uh, it could have been Bundy. Or somebody where they even said, like, or the way that they did it, they knew it was, like, once they got out of the county, mm-hmm. they were mm-hmm. fucking already good. Yeah, yeah. it's so much easier to yeah, get Yeah, like, you stuff. get out of the county back then, they don't even know who the hell, you know, if you have another arrest record, they have to go and ask them. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't come up for them. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Even, then, even, like, fingerprints and DNA and stuff. Right. 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 The, and... Again, they didn't. They weren't able to identify, you know, who who the hair was from either. Um, so even if you put like your know, horrible but they did, communication and trying to be shady, you're mm-hmm. never gonna know what happened. <laughs> yeah, no, Mm-mm. no. Um, but yeah, 
you know, there are some reports that say it said that, you know, the apartment had a cult from it or paraphernalia. Um, and in this one report, it says in particular, there was evidence of numerous items related to the cult group, the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, oh, wow. founded by cultist Carl Kellner and Theodore Roos. Um, the same group also gained the attention of Aleister Crowley, who perhaps was the most influential member of the order. You know what's funny? The way they word that, most people probably think, oh, Aleister Crowley came across the OTO and was interested. But the OTO, those guys, approached Aleister Crowley. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of, you know. But go right, ahead. right. So the neighbors of the couple said there was nothing unusual in the days leading up to the murders. Um, and the last known sighting of Green and Marin had been on a New York subway where they were described as behaving perfectly normal. So the last thing I'm going to read here, um, someone wrote a letter to Maury Terry, who, you know, was investigating the son of Sam oh, yeah. and how, you know, he believed that, you know, it was more than one person and it was an occult group. Um, oh, so I wish he you received into this. Did, huh? he, did he get into this or no? I would get... a little bit. Oh, um, right. So he received an anonymous anonymous letter from a sus- suspected member of the Ordo Templi Orientis, of which he wrote of in his book, The Ultimate Evil. And it reads, "Dear Maury Terry, please look into this double killing." Carol was asking people about the OTO a year prior to the murders. I can't accept that the people responsible for this are still walking around free. I am afraid that the problems will not go away and the, that minds this unbalanced may perpetuate additional horrors. Forgive me for not signing my name. I haven't gotten over the fear. So, um, so yeah, no one really knows because, um, uh, you know, investigators dropped the ball. I, I haven't even heard, you know, aside from the guy, you know, with the, you know, that was supposedly draining blood from the mice or potentially like the landlord wanting the apartment. But I mean, there's not been any other suspects they've mentioned. Um, Brooklyn lost the cold, the, the file. So like, you know, I'm sure nothing's going to happen. I haven't seen anything in the news since 2002 on this case. Wow. So, I mean, basically, oh, so they never even found, they were just suspects and they never made an arrest either, right? Mm-mm. Yeah, I forgot. No. Was there was ever still. anything uh, more on the guy who liked to drain mice's blood? No, just that uh, he claims that he never talked to the detective and he never said he, like, drained blood from mice or anything, which I would think, you know, I don't, even if he was draining mice from blood, like, doing that to a human being moving to a human being that's a much bigger yeah. step up yeah. um and james Devereux, the one um Brooklyn well, how much detect- time difference was there in between these stories you know what i'm saying so, like when was he known for draining rats blood and how old was he uh, when this happened he, so at the beginning he came up and they in the articles i read you know they briefly mentioned him and stuff and that he was you know um you know, he said he was never approached by the detective, um, and he never said those things. So, um, but, yeah, at the beginning, they looked at him. But James Devereaux, the one Brooklyn detective, said that there was, this was clearly a satanic crime, and there's it was no way one man job. Mm. Uh, and why is there any, like, ritual you can think of that would kind of go along with that, like draining blood? In that way, I just find that so weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know, because I know like the like blood draining was like a common, not a common, but like a a way of you know committing suicide, right? Yeah, there was even. I mean, you know, looking into the Kellogg's, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, blood draining was going on back then, still in a, in a way of supposedly healing yourself for things. Mm-hmm. So, I mean. Who knows when it comes to blood draining? Anyway. I mean, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't want to get conspiratorial, like, too out there. And this is just an idea or a theory. But, like, when you start getting into a blood and occult stuff, I mean, you, this could be anything now. It could be down to the point to where people just want bags of blood to mm-hmm. use on themselves for fucking with magic and, you know, needing resources after the fact. 
Yeah. You know, well, are you and drinking Nick, it? And, uh, I mean, are you drawing sigils with it? Are you even writing with it? Well, Nix was saying that like the blood, yeah. uh, the stab wounds were in the same place on both bodies. Yes. So I, I wonder, yeah, no, I really, yeah. I really do think that, that. I do think that the the stabbing in the eye and the beating on the one eye, I really do think that. And with, you know, a crazy eight, like you have those three eights. You would have eight, would be the prince. Then you know four, across from that on the tree of life, is the king, and then right above that would be uh, Chokma, and then that would be Janus. So technically, that's Janus on his, like, second lower arc already, because you have Chokma, the lower arc of that is Jupiter, and then the lower arc of that is Mercury. So you've already... So to me, it's just like, like, again, like I was saying, more, in a sense, Janus symbolism, or just left and right pillar duality, you know? <laughs> Especially if you think of this, too, in a sense, I, I know this is like this could be maybe thinking into it too much. But, you know, when you hit punch somebody in the face and you leave a bruise or whatever, that's like the blood coming to the, the surface as well. You know, I think even blood and red is used a lot of being shown being birthed into this reality. You know, that's, again, going with the left side, the blood, the black, you know, I could be thinking into it too much, but you never know. Blood's been used in all kinds of rituals since the beginning of time. Like, you know, something about it being the life force, and that's, you know, why they use it a lot, um, and that it's, you know, a powerful, you know, thing to be used in a ritual. Um, I actually wonder, too, because a couple years before, you know, this this murder, or during this time, you know, the, the son of Sam was going on. So I almost wonder if this could have been something tied to the, you know, the theory that Moritari had the Sons of Sam and the Process Church, um, because they were doing, you know, things in Untermeyer Park, you know, with sacrificing animals and um, everything. So I almost wonder if maybe, you know, that could be a part of it. You know, and even at some point up, kind of getting close to going upstate, kind of like, I mean, not relatively close, but not too far from where the Son of Sam stuff happened either. When you start going upstate a little bit farther, you do start getting secret societies popping up later on as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, even in my opinion, there is a large area right there with the Son of Sam and up a little bit more where you have a lot of weird shit going on. Mm -hmm. You know, serial killing, uh, uh, secret societies popping up. Uh, I mean, you, you, you fucking New York, you start going up there, you, you traces back to Mormonism. I mean, you got a lot of weird shit with upstate mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, something is up with that area. I don't know if it's a landline, a ley line for weirdness or what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or like demented reality. <laughs> Maybe there's a portal there. Yeah. yeah like, I mean, I know. <laughs> something to where like <clears throat> almost like a demon aspect just latches yeah. onto people. I don't know. I know and why we've talked about like places where you know, uh, seem to have more, uh, strange, high strangeness things going on. That's and a perfect whether, way to say it, high strangeness. Yeah. Whether it's something, you know, that's always naturally been there or whether it's something that was created, like, you know, they talk about Jack Parsons and, um, Hubbard, like being in the desert and potentially opening a portal that they didn't close. Um, there does seem to be certain areas, um, where, these activities seem to, you know, kind of all fall into. And so. Well, I, I have to say, just from what you've covered with this uh, this first one, I definitely think there might have been something behind it mm -hmm. with the occultism. You know, the numbers and, and stuff it just it seems really weird. You mm -hmm. know, the, the 88, the 80, and then, I mean, mm -hmm. the ages, even the ages I thought was weird. Like you said, yeah. they both add to six. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even the 33. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, just the know. identical nature of the, what happened to their bodies. I just, it's mm -hmm. obviously ritualistic and mm -hmm. to me, but for, for sure. what purpose, who knows? I mean, right? that's a good point there. I don't know how many times you'd have to recreate that, but you are going towards ritualistic killing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. For sure. It's the same thing. Right. To both of them. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a random yeah. struggle and, and then they ended up dead. Right? And, you know, and if, let's say this, the suspected people we're somehow associated with going to, frequenting, being a member of, practicing OTO type stuff. 
you know, if that's a possibility and that's true. And then, like I said, the people then being found in Jersey. And when I said prior about the Golden Dawn, that just seems very fucking weird. You know, very, uh, you know, maybe that's too conspiratorial. Maybe that's a little too far out there. But just for me, the whole thing, just uh, shady. And that's why it's on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, there's not, you know, much more to that case because it's, you know, the ball was dropped on it. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And it doesn't sound like it's going to be something that's going to be solved anytime Oh, no, soon. That, they're, they're done with that already. What was yeah. you said the last time yeah. they mentioned something, 2002? Two, yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah, yeah, Where they lost, about, lost the case about. file. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to move on to the next case, which is um, for this historic case, I am doing Peter Nears, and, a.k.a. the medieval boogeyman who ate babies, and he's also known as the cannibal magician. What a so, name. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Nears was born in 1540 to a peasant family in Germany. And it was during the height of serfdom, which is the condition of being in a position of servitude um, required to render services to a lord. Um, so, in medieval Europe, where a tenant farmer was bound to a plot of land and to the will of his landlord. So they're pretty much, um, you know, debt bondage slaves back then is what the serfdom was. But um, as a peasant, life for years consisted mostly of oppression and enforced taxes. No one in his, in his family um, could really afford. Nears saw firsthand the struggles of rampant classism, the inhumane living conditions and treatment of the peasant class were a catalyst for his later sociopathy. Nears' murder spree took place in the aftermath of a, a countrywide peasant uprising that began in 1525, and it was known as the German Peasants War. The revolution naturally fostered a hostile environment of violence in which groups of thieving highwaymen roamed. And this is where Nears formed a gang of his own in, and I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, it's uh, a city in France, Alsace, France. Uh, he was mentored by a fellow murderer by the name of Martin Steer. And he was a shepherd and murderer who organized 48 to 49 fellow shepherds into a gang of bandits. Damn. After a 22-year crime spree, Steer was arrested 22? and executed. What's that? 22 years? 22. Uh, yeah. Yo, 22. you know what I noticed? Early, I, 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 you know, I had mentioned From Hell before. I hope I remember it when I record. I keep forgetting to write it down. It just popped into my head because you said 22. That movie From Hell is two hours and two minutes long. Of course it is. And Janice again falls on the second <laughs> sphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Said <laughs> no, that even brought me back to. I was like, is that what X twenty two was getting at as well? Yeah. Yeah. Better write it down now. Yeah. <laughs> and you just said twenty two here, so right, yes. go ahead. Um, and he was arrested and executed in fifteen seventy two. Um, so Nears kind of um, followed his footsteps um, in more ways than one, which I'll get to here a little bit later, but. Nears and his rotating group of 24 bandits terrorized the European countryside for years as they stole from and murdered travelers on remote highways. Um, his network constantly was changing its composition, sometimes joining together for major raids, while other times splitting up into smaller groups and pursue, pursue robberies and killings on a smaller scale over different areas. Eventually, the game became brazen enough to march into towns and villages to murder, rape, and attack uh, citizens pillaging for goods. The game traveled hundreds of miles across Germany and western France um, and the Rhineland and Bavaria. In 1577, after an 11 years of crime, Nears and oh members God. of his gang were captured for the first time. And one of Nears' accomplices, um, possibly two over the years, um, turned him in, which resulted in him being arrested and tortured. So he reportedly confessed to 75 murders, some of which 
explained several accounts of missing local women. However, Nieder somehow managed to escape his first imprisonment and avoid execution. Over the next few years, until his final arrest in 1581, a number of pamphlets, ballads, and stories were written and circulated detailing his cannibalism, black magic rituals, and supernatural abilities. Yo, um, people are making pamphlets about this guy and instead of putting him around? Yeah. In the 1500s. So that couldn't have been cheap either. Mm-mm. It was significant. Yeah. So yeah. Johann Wick, who was possibly the first ever true crime reporter, wrote a collection of these pamphlets uh, regarding years between 1577 and 1583, revealing the depths of his depravity. The stories claimed before his execution that Martin Steer, who was kind of like the mentor to Nears, um, trained Nears in the art of black magic. Historians reported black, uh, German black magic practitioners from this era believe candles made from the fetus skin and fat allowed for invisibility and other supernatural powers. Legend also wow. claimed cannibalizing fetuses could give one the ability to transform into an object or animal. Whoa. Wow. Well, how do you get back? <laughs> <laughs> it just wears Good off. Question. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> just like you go from a table to like poof, back into your own yeah. table. Just fall on the floor. Yeah. You're just back. There you go. Like the finders. <laughs> yeah, great. The floor. You, yeah. Yeah. yeah right. You you find yourself like out like in the fucking middle of a field. You're like racing. <laughs> <laughs> so so weird. as a black magician, it was believed Nears acquired an appetite for infant infant set infanticide. Sorry. He said he was said to have used the skin of infants to make candles that allowed him to break into homes undetected. Furthermore, it was reported he hacked off the hands and feet of infants and cut out their hearts and ate them. He allegedly also removed the breasts of young girls he killed. Now, that makes me think of some of the serial killers we've had today, like the Ripper Crew, who would, um, another, you know, uh, occult crime. Uh, a lot of times with uh, their victims of women, they would cut off their breasts. Uh. Um, so while on the run, Nears was reported to have frequently changed his appearance to avoid being apprehended some of those appearances he took on were a leper a goat and a soldier he always was known to carry money two loaded pistols and a broadsword in his night or i'm sorry in his 1579 arrest warrant he was described as rather old with crooked fingers and a scar on his chin and you can tell by the picture that i sent you he was not he he he's a rather unfortunate fellow he was he was not blessed (laughs) In the looks department, um, which, you know, I could never understand why he was so angry, you know, looking like that. But, okay. So, um, you know, it's funny. It, if you're not looking at it and you're just listening to the description, I was like, it was, is this like some goetic demon you're describing? <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he's definitely um, unsavory on the eyes, for sure. Um so, in 1581, his reign of terror came to an end, um, and by the time of his arrest, his notoriety was known throughout the country. Um, as his physical description um, circulated in warrants and pamphlets. Despite this, he attempted to hide in plain sight. I'm wondering if he thought he was invisible at the time, maybe, or something, I don't know. Um <laughs> When he stopped at a lodge, he had one of his skin candles with him. He was right. (laughs) Reminds me of Big Daddy when the kid puts the glasses on. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So he stopped at a lodge in Newmark called the Bells. There he asked the The local Mm -hmm. That's interesting because again, but going back to (laughs) from hell, something that I noticed in that movie, uh, they're always going, especially the the prostitutes. They're always going to this bar called the Ten Bells, and I wrote that down. Mm, yeah. Like the so there he, the there he asked the local innkeeper to hold his leather pouch so he could visit a bathhouse. This would be prove to be his fatal mistake. While Nears was bathing, the townsfolk confronted the innkeeper and demanded him to open the leather pouch. Inside were the dried hearts and hands of fetuses. Upon discovery of the black magician's possessions, Nears was e- easily apprehended from the bathhouse. 
Now, I don't know if you're familiar with like this bag they're talking about where he had these items like um, reminds me of a mojo bag. Have you ever heard of that? Like um, from uh, African-American, um, the spiritual practice of hoodoo. Oh, so, yeah. Um, I've heard of mojo bags. Like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah you can make them. They're almost like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I would equate that to, like, instead of, like, drawing out a talisman or a sigil, you can make a mojo bag that would have, like, actually, like, you know, physical stuff in it. And then you would just carry that with you right. instead of the talisman. Yeah, it's pretty much an amulet consisting of a flannel bag containing one or more magical items. Yeah. Um, it's also called a con- like, It's like a spell in a bag. Yeah, you can put, like, uh, herbs, crystals. Yeah. And some people put, like... Uh, you know, like uh, essential oils onto their, you know, huge little... Mm-hmm. What's interesting, though, is, like, everybody, so many people don't know, like, mojo is, like, tied back to the mojo ba- bag. Like, somehow it was associated with um, sex organs, like, mostly the male penis, and blues singer Muddy Waters, who's um, McKinley Morganfield. Oh. First thing about it with that connotation um in the song i got my mojo working which influenced uh jim morrison from the doors um to write mr mojo rising um (laughs) which yeah so which is also an anagram for jim morrison but you know from that and austin powers so many people don't know like what mojo means actually where it derived from I was going to say, the first time I heard that word is Austin Powers. Yeah, I lost my mojo, baby. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, but that's what, I don't know, this bag they're claiming that he had kind of reminded me of. um, So, but many people believe Nears was so easily arrested because he um, was separated from his magical items, which were believed to make him invisible. Um. So Nears surrendered and confessed to an astronomical 544 murders, which included 24 pregnant women. Now, I know a lot of times, like, we were like, okay, was he coerced under confession and stuff? Well, you can confess to that you killed people, but I don't think you need to confess to that money or that many. Like, you know, if you didn't kill that many, why would you? Yeah. So, like, I know a lot of times that comes into play. Well, maybe, maybe he was coerced or whatever, but I would think, you know, you wouldn't want to inflate the number you killed during that, but right. well, you know, something I do want to ask you, and I'm not, I'm not discrediting this, this stuff at mm-hmm. all, but do you think any, I mean, if you start entertaining some of the things that this guy supposedly was able to do, I mean, if you entertain I, any of that, like you have to sort like, or entertain the fact that that's been said about him and you want to look at it, do you start to then have to question how much of this story is embellished to begin with? And that's, I get into that a little bit later. Unless you're going to believe end. this guy was really shape shifting no, and no, you know, walking yeah, around with no, skin no, candles. No, not so invisible. much. I think, you know, sometimes like um, there are actual things that happen and then, you know, people, you know, add, you know, little things to the story there here or there to make it more frightening or, you know, um, you know, more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, crazy, you know. Um, no, I was so, just wondering, like, if you if you think about it, he he's like the, you know, because like even back in the day, people, you know, just because like you were saying before, Teresa, that's probably going to cost money. People would spend money and make pamphlets and flyers and spread propaganda, or mm-hmm. spread spread like you know, uh, you know, over the top type stuff. Mm-hmm. So like I, I'm sure I'm totally believing that this guy was into some crazy stuff. I'm just wondering, oh, yeah. like, was this like the satanic panic image for that? You know, almost like even like I would have to say, and I'm not defending the guy. He was totally fucked up and he did plenty of horrible stuff. But there is a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff that Crowley has pointed Mm -hmm. at that I think is just misunderstood people making Mm -hmm. him look worse than he already is. You don't Mm -hmm. need to. Yeah, no, I definitely think people (laughs) embellish stories. Yeah, it's like you you just don't understand what he wrote. You know, just like a scary ghost story or parents using it to scare their kids or something like that, you know. I definitely don't think, like, everything is completely true here. Because, like, um, back in really the day, hard. like, if you thought of Satan, it just had Elvis to Crowley's face, you know? The mm-hmm. devil, that, that was him, the beast. You know, this was, like, mm-hmm. the horrible man back then. It's just, just right. like, an earlier version. <laughs> right, right. So, um, the Newmark executioners delivered an especially violent and slow death upon Nears. He was tortured over the course of three days. So the first day, the flesh was skinned from his body and hot oil was poured into his wounds. Mm. I'm not really sure how someone doesn't, like, 
go into shock or sepsis, you know, from infection, like, and die, like, pretty soon after that, or just from the blood loss. But um, that was the first day of torture for him. So on day two, his feet were greased and held above burning coals in an effort to roast him alive. And on the third and final day, September 16th, 1581, he was strapped to the wheel, the infamous medieval torture device, which was a large wheel designed to break bones and or crush someone to death. The wheel was slammed down upon him 42 times, which turns to equal six. Um, (laughs) Still alive. um, Some allege he might have still been alive because of his, you know, pact and deals with the devil. He was finally dismembered and quartered um, by the executioner who had to hack his limbs off to finally kill him. Did they say he was quartered? So not quartered in the sense of like where they did use the the drawn and quartered like they did with the, you know, the horses back then where they would tie you like they just cut off his arms and legs Uh quartered that way. So I wasn't aware. I always thought it's quartered as, you know, where they tied him to the horses, you know, each limb. Um, But I I was wondering if they actually literally cut him into four pieces. So that's what I was. Yeah. I was was trying to see if it would follow a path on the tree. I was thinking gotcha. six to four, but mm-hmm. I think that technically is five pieces. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which would be so, a pentagram. Yeah, sure would. So mm-hmm. now I'm going to talk a little bit about, like, you know, myth or legend. So the combination of popular contemporary folklore and the passage of time rendered the details of Nier's life and crimes somewhat unreliable. His crimes and kill count could be exaggerating. Um, So separating fact from fiction in Nier's tale becomes more convoluted by the accounts of two contemporary serial killers during the same time, and that was Chrisman, Gena Pertanga, and Peter Stunk. So Gena Pertanga allegedly murdered 964 people and also was executed the wheel in June 1581, so the same year but a couple months before Nier's. Stunk believes himself to be a werewolf, and allegedly ate 14 kids, and like Nears, was also known to have made a pact with the devil. Uh, based on the inflated kill count, historians believe Geta Pertanga was a fictitious combination of Nears and similar murderers of the time. And I'm thinking, how many other people do you have out there like this? Like, yeah. similar murders? Like, like that, I mean... Why is this trending? Why is this trending? I'm sure I might have mentioned it to both of you. So probably, maybe more you, Nick, because you do talk to me about true crime. I've sent me a lot of true crime stuff. Mm-hmm. Have I ever mentioned that um, Sword and Stone, I think it's like episode 22, it might be even episode 22 or episode 20. Uh, the guy, is that the one with the puppet guy? The, yeah, um, and he like ends up fo- finding like this like underground group of people that fucking eat children. Yeah, yeah or at least they're wanting to eat children. Yeah. It was hard to like know if like they were actually doing Yo, that, it or that not. That one they, that was a chick that he was talking to, I'm sorry mm-hmm. to say, but she was very convincing. Like that mm-hmm. sounded like some like a sick motherfucker that did not give two craps about anything. And mm-hmm. actually got off on it. Yeah. Like, that that yeah. one was very compelling to where I was like, this person sounds like they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're telling them how to you would skin it and cook it. Yeah, that's crazy. There's another... And this was a dude who worked for, what, he had a uh, public television, you know, a church public television thing. Guy making puppets for some church. Got caught with child pornography on his computer. And in mm-hmm. chat rooms talking about people with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there there was sword and, Albert. St- uh, sword and Scale or something like that it's called? Yeah, Sword That's and like Scale. That's like episode uh, 20 or 22. If you yeah. want to get freaked and then, out and like really, I couldn't even, it literally took me three times to listen to the whole show. Go check that out. Um, Albert Fish was another one who supposedly ate children um, and had like recipes and stuff um, for, you mm. know, with how to cook um, and Crazy. I think there was another one, I can't remember, in Montana, I want to say jo- Bar Jonah or something like that. And he was really, like, supposedly he was, like, maybe eating children, too, especially with the one he he abducted. So, um, 
unfortunately does seem to be out there and some people are into that. I mean, even like you, um, I mean, I've even like, army, I, it's army not, hammer, army hammer yeah. was talking about cannibalism. Yes. I mean, that's, I, it, I mean, I do say it, I've even said it as a joke at times, but like, it's really not funny because I think of this stuff when I mm-hmm. say it, you know, and, and I, I highly doubt, you know, it's to that extreme, but like I've said before, you know, when we look at politicians or people with even podcasts, you know, you don't know if this is what that person is doing for Sunday dinner because <laughs> you saw them for an hour on TV. Mm-hmm. There are actual sick people that do shit like that, and you have no I, idea. Wait, have you seen? Have you seen the um, the movie Fresh? No, but I have heard no. about that. So that was really interesting. Like you know, it's almost like you think about like uh, the business Hello Fresh. They're pretty much doing that, but it's humans they're doing that and they indicate like it's the elite that want it and like in these packages with this human meat they send they send like articles of like clothing or belongings of those victims to make it more personal like when they eat them whoa what? and in the yeah and in the, at the end of the credits like at the end they show like you know supposedly like you know it looks to be the elite sitting down at a table like you know consuming human flesh and there's a you know uh a, a you know bath met you know symbol in there oh, and stuff so it just it makes you wonder and especially with sometimes you know it seems like in entertainment you know there's some subtle hints like that they're putting out there and everything um so I don't know. Very weird. Yeah. Very weird indeed. Yeah. So, um, has there seemed to be no accounts that claim Mears was fake and because his victim count appears to be legitimate, I don't know how to legitimize that. Um, it's just what it says. Um, but they said this medieval boogeyman could very well be considered one of the most prolific killer serial killers of all time. Yeah. That is wild. No kidding. Wow. I mean, I can imagine like being a highwayman and during the the peasant uprising and stuff. Um, you know, he could have had quite a few murder victims. What if whether he was consuming them or not exactly? I don't know, but I would imagine he probably did have a large amount of victims. Whether it was as much as they claimed, I don't know. But yeah. Jeez. The thing that strikes me, not only, well, there's so many things that strike me about it, but one of the things is funny, there seems to be so much more information about this historical case than the 1979 cold case. Yes. Like there's records and like. I was thinking the same thing because I was looking at my notes and I'm like, this is like really sad. Like this modern day case like has so little attention. It was so gruesome. And, you know, I can't like. Yo, and where I did this, where did this case knew. happen again? Like, where was this? Like, was this like in a well-populated area, or was this like? Are you talking about the second case? The yeah, yeah. Case? I mean, like, it was, so or was it this was like somebody who like kind of like lived in like bumfuck nowhere? No, he actually traveled all around um, Germany it's still and into weird, France. Though, but, like and... somebody who was traveling that, like, like you're saying, so detailed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, that seventy-nine cold case. It makes you wonder, like how much of the public knew about that? Did they really give it much publicity back then and stuff? Because I mean, I would think, you know, people would be in a panic about that and be, you know, demanding, you know, a thorough investigation be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in 2002, you know, the one detective, you know, you know, continues, you know, to think it was, you know, a satanic crime and everything. I just feel like, you know, there was so much shady stuff that went on with the son of Sam yeah. It wouldn't surprise me that I, that this tried to get swept under the rug for whatever reason. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's not the traditional way someone, you know, the traditional murder methods that people use. I mean, everything like, you know, that was done to desecrate their bodies. Um, and the fact that the blood was completely drained. Well, you, you, what, you, what I would think, and unfortunately, like so much time has passed. Depending on what type of neighborhood this is in, I, I'm just thinking from when I was growing up as a kid, back, you know, in the early 80s, this is a little bit later, I'm sure if, like, someone on our block, like, just showed up, like, two bodies dead in a house like that, 
the, at least the surrounding neighborhood you could go back to and would probably even tell you then be like yeah we were on the cops ass or not you know mm -hmm. i'm sure like if you went like unfortunately it's too late now i'm sure most of the people that live there are, are dead and gone moved or whatever mm -hmm. but maybe if we you know knew about this 20 years ago and you just went back over there and interviewed the people in the area you'd get an idea of maybe how much they pushed mm -hmm. finding out what the hell happened because i'm thinking mm -hmm. Back then, uh, you know, people would be like, yo, what the F just happened? You know? Mm -hmm. Are and you going to find out who did that? I live across the street. Yeah. I'm just guessing, but maybe not. But, like, that would give you somewhat of an idea, at least going back into the neighborhood, how much of a panic was there? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure there would be some people who would tell you they were probably scared. Yeah. And I know, like, And they I wanted the cops to find out who did it. I can't remember the year Berkowitz was apprehended. But I don't know, like maybe like no one really noticed because all the focus was on that, um, you know, and that kind of distracted from that. So um, because the whole Son of Sam thing was going on. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it's just it's weird. Well, and then for it to even be suppressed in the press and everything, it sounds like it didn't get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Probably because I mean, in my mind, it goes to like people in the community or the police force being involved, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're part of a coven. Yeah. And <laughs> I did but then, you, know like, what's, you know, what's funny. Like then this is the, the sad thing going back in the day, just real quick. I, and just knowing how it was when I was a kid, but if there was a rumor going around that those people were taken out by the mafia, nobody probably would have said shit. Mm -hmm. So even if you spread some bullshit fear idea, maybe people won't say anything anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it'd be like and really interesting if you could actually talk to the people in the area. And see what they had thought about that crime. Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, right. Really. Yeah, and I did find uh, an article like in a newspaper, like from like back, you know, when it happened in, in December of seventy nine, and it wasn't even like front page news. It was in with a bunch of different articles listed on a page and stuff. And I'm just like, that's odd. Do you think that'd be like front page news? Yeah, exactly. Right. I don't know. Seems like it's suppressed on purpose. Mm -hmm. Very weird. Mm -hmm. Very weird. And back into the historical one, like how he was like pressed with the wheel like 42 times. Mm -hmm. Just made me think of like the 42 like Egyptian judges. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it's like a weird See, like that would go back to like what I was trying to look at again, the six, four and two. That's mm -hmm. why I was wondering if he's being cut into because at, mm -hmm. at the middle of the tree where a small child actually the symbol, a baby or a child would go. Uh, six in the sixth sphere, if you're still going up, I guess, in the energy side, um, you would go to four, which is, uh, the, you know, uh, Jupiter and the wheel of fortune card goes there. You know, you got a wheel again, which is just, you know, going up to that side of the tree. And then two again would be Janus on Chokma. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I was like looking at those numbers. Cause I just, my mind, I see like how it moves in that area. I don't know, I was just thinking you would think like there wouldn't be as big as of a crime uh crime problem back then with the way you were tortured and <laughs> executed. Like you think right. you think these people wouldn't be doing crazy shit like yeah, that. Well, like <laughs> Well and to murder people in the hundreds. I mean, like that's yeah. that's yeah. obviously extreme. Like yeah. it just makes me think, of course, that this person is under some sort of like demonic possession. Like I don't think mm -hmm. you know, even people with no. an appetite for violence. Mm -hmm. like go right. that far with it like i don't no, know no no if those claims are even like half true that's somebody who's like mm -hmm. far gone oh yeah that is sure. like i i do not at that point and this is just my take on this type of stuff that person is no longer who they were when they were born here something else has taken control or that that literally that soul mm -hmm. is not even there anymore i don't think yeah. or barely you right. know it's almost like a host for something that is not who that person was anymore yeah. Mm -hmm. As scary, sure. creepy and wild as that sounds, I do think like you've, that's not the person that God created. Or at least that was yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I know. It seems In like a been sense. Yeah, I know that sounds cheesy, but. No, it makes sense. And then even to like his uh, mojo bag or whatever, mm -hmm. like how he was arrested when it was separated from him. Mm -hmm. So maybe those items weren't even like invisibility, like mm -hmm. to, as in not to be able to see. Maybe those rituals that he did promotes a frequency of like, untouchability right mm -hmm. you know so like yeah. that's why he didn't get caught till then yeah and it, it, that's you know, you know it, it's kind of um almost like um 
a, a language difference where like, you know, the bag could be more of metaphorically, like not invisible, but untouchable, just like yeah. you said, um, mm-hmm. you know, but it became embellished, you know, for the sake of stories and ballads and stuff. Sure. So, um, and if he, you know, you know, was dabbling with the call, you know, uh, obviously, you know, he was opening himself up to maybe entities like NY said that could have, you know, entered him. And one of the reasons why he became, you know, such, such a sociopath. Yeah. Well, he was probably protected for a long time by then, by them, you know, Mm -hmm. if that's Mm -hmm. how how it went down. You know, another thing, and it, it was another reason why I, I guess I used Crowley as an example before, and it's not just Crowley. There's plenty of other well-known magicians, though. They have all claimed, you know, doing invisibility. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, but yeah. like I even think, in my my opinion, and this is just, you know, I think it, from what I've gotten out of the few things I've read with Crowley, I've I've always taken it as not that you're actually invisible. It's just you're not on people's minds. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or just exactly. you're, not, you're not a thought in their mind anymore. It's almost like maybe mm-hmm. you turned off the off switch on an off switch for a second and then you'll put it on when you want. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's funny. Yeah. Which I think a lot of that like too, like, you know, is manipulation tactics as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and in both the cases, it deals with like with blood. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, there is obviously something to like, consuming humans especially children mm-hmm. and then just when you were talking it made me think of like that um natural flavoring h-e-k 293 oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. and i was like well if you put that in our food now i don't even want to know i have no idea what you're talking about you don't about. know what that is no so if uh, you're bringing human, it up with eating children I, so. yeah human <laughs> embryonic kidney cells yeah. that are mm-hmm. used to develop flavoring in popular junk foods like Doritos or like oh, you, know you know what? I think I've actually heard that before. Yeah. So like, likely I, they're I just from, was like, I don't want to know more about this. Well, likely from aborted cells. So oh, that's mm-hmm. like, um, you know, that that's worse than when I, that stuff with the Estee Lauder, the night serum, the stuff I yes. that was in, uh, what was that little Nas X video or whatever? And you know, what's funny in that video. Oh, that video is packed. <laughs> they do focus on people eating Doritos a few times. Do they? No. Yes, I shit you not. At one point, I was like, I started wondering, is this whole video kind of just like marketing for him? Or, you know, getting paid. Because he showed Estee Lauder, then he's showing them eating Doritos, specifically Doritos. So, but like, for all you know, like all these, this is really weird. The Estee Lauder Night Serum has uh, fermented uh, spinal bifida in it. So like spinal fluid, yeah. On when you it comes from, it's a birth defect on a newborn child. Oh, spinal bifida, yeah. <gasps> it's a sac that grows on the spinal cord, and when it ferments, or I don't know if they ferment it after they take it out, but they get that shit out of there, fermented, and then added with this stuff, and that's that shit. You know, chicks are out there putting on their freaking face, no, what the fuck? trying to look nice. <laughs> Sandra Bullock was on Ellen. Yes. She talked about like using some cream that has foreskins of babies. Yeah. So like, they, now you're going fore- back to even stuff with Doritos having baby stuff in it. It's like, okay, well now we're seeing uh, Estee Lauder night serum with baby, baby spinal bacteria fluid. And now some other stuff on Doritos. With the- it's in lots of foods. It's not just Doritos. No, but, but you did mention Doritos. Yeah. Yeah. No, because. So that, I'm like, yo, yeah. we're seeing a lot of baby <laughs> stuff in this, this one video. I have to go back now. Well, and it's just crazy, like, you know, you know, infants, you know, the killing of infants and stuff has gone back to the beginning of times, and it's still a topic today. Yes. Um, still a hot topic, you know, you go back to, you know, the Canaan, uh, Canaanites religion and, you know, um, sacrificing their children in Moloch and stuff, and, you know, now, you know, all these bits and pieces of infants... You know what the number one stuff. number one common surgery that's done at the Shriners Hospital is? What? The, removing that thing. The what? spina bifida thing, removing it. No. Yes. At Shriners Hospitals. Yes. Good Lord. Guys, it who, all goes who back is to... Who in the order it of does. the Masons? Just throwing that out there. 
Very there's a Shriners Hospital in Pittsburgh, um, not far from me. Well, at least well, I had said it, that at one of the hospitals I looked at when I was covering the Order of Quetzalcoatl and the Shriners. Crazy. And it does go back, you know, to the previous episode you were on the Balenciaga stuff. Like, it all goes back to this mm-hmm. ancient stuff. Mm-hmm. So if entities, you know, were involved, it's just they're doing the same shit they've always done. Mm-hmm. Influencing humans nothing, to do perverted things. Just like uh, my boy's uh, podcast, Nothing New Under the Sun. There really is not. No, I think it's just a, a cyclic thing of ideas that have always existed. It's mm-hmm. just done differently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Totally. You know, maybe we have more technology, so we looks different when we reenact it or redo it. Yes, but it's the same thing. Exactly. That's crazy, though. Yeah. Well, yo, I had a, that was really good. I had a great time. Thanks. Yeah. You're pretty yeah, thanks much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're pretty yeah. much. Uh, you're done now, right? I assume. Like What's I wasn't, cu- I wasn't cutting your off. You're oh no, yeah, no, okay. no, 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 <laughs> uh-uh, no, no. That's that's what I got. All right, thank you. That was yeah. That was a really interesting. I had not really known. About, I didn't know about the last one at all. Um, I don't think I knew about the first one until you may have told me about it. Yes. And I looked into it very little. Unfortunately, I wish I would have known it happened in New York because I might have been able to maybe look into that a little bit more. Or I yeah, had forgotten that it did because I'm. It's definitely yeah. hard to find stuff on it. Yeah, there's not a lot out well, there. Well, I was just wondering if there was even ways to, because uh, I wouldn't have cared. I mean, I, maybe if I had to go down there, I mean, maybe I would have went, but that would have been pushing it. But like, <laughs> you know, there is ways that you can go and actually like get, uh, you know, certain amount of depending if it's closed or open. They can release what a certain about amount lost? of yeah. Well, it was they lost. well they can <laughs> it was lost. you know give you certain you know whatever on the evidence of the case or whatever they can you know allowed to give you. I was just wondering if there was any details I could have gotten at all myself. You know what I'm saying? Well, I wonder even if they hadn't lost it, if they would even be willing to do that because it was. I mean, technically, it should still be considered an open case. Mm. And I know normally with open cases they don't share much. Yeah. Uh, That's true. Yeah, I wasn't expecting much, but I might have tried. You know, <laughs> I might could have asked maybe my brother to do something. I have no idea. You know? So who knows? You would have given it your best effort. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a phone call and a text. <laughs> 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 maybe went on the website. You know, went mm-hmm. on the internet for a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for coming on. Uh, I thought those were very interesting, and that's why I wanted to have you on because they both. Uh, I mean, they both fit, I guess, my channel in a sense. But they both mm-hmm. go back to, you know, possible occult symbolism or ritual stuff going on. Yeah, there's more out there than you think, too. Yeah. There's I mean, like that so one much... person was already admitting to pretty outlandish stuff already. So mm-hmm. that's not even, you know, conspiracy unless the source was completely wrong. Yeah. But that person didn't even make outland- outlandish claims, in my opinion. I mean, but yeah, there's plenty like modern day and historic um, crimes that revolve around the occult, like yes. they're just not talked about. Yes, I'm pretty sure you'll uh, you'll come on to cover more of them in the future. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, thank you. Thank uh, you you want to let everybody know uh, your Instagram again? Yeah, it's Nyx N Y X period one two two three. Very good, and that is in uh, the bottom in the show notes. And Teresa, would you like to say, uh, would you like to plug your show one more time? <laughs> sure. Well, thank you, Nick. That was super interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's crazy. But um, yeah, so if people want to hear more from me and don't find me super annoying, you can check me out <laughs> on the Spiritual Gangsters, uh, which will be in the links below. And I'm the most active on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. Maybe I should get on Twitter. I don't know. Oh, Maybe God, that's I where it's you, at. I but I, I never, uh, I made an account like, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I just like never did anything with it. So I have to, I have to be honest. Yeah. I, I really wish you did prior to me like losing the the occult rejects original account because yeah. I, I guess I guess because I you know just following back so many people, I just used to see like the most like oh my god, I just would have been tagging you in so much like silly shit. You just been like yo, I can't believe this stuff. <laughs> like either <laughs> right? really interesting, like really good stuff, or to the most extreme like ridiculous stuff. Yes. Uh, I'm just like, yo, when it comes to that, I, I feel like it's sometimes worse than Instagram. Mm. <laughs> There's days. I, I've it, heard, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, or just with, like, sometimes just with, like, uh, oh, man. Just, I'm sure there was times that if you would have seen live 
certain <laughs> debates exchanging with, yeah, back on and Twitter, forth, you right? were like, wow, this is really getting good. You're like, damn, it's juicy. Yeah, yeah, I know. There was a few times I was like, damn, Teresa can't see it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it would help with the show, though, in my opinion. To maybe extent. I should just make one. It may be like 10%, I'd hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's like another thing. I, I think, and then we'll wrap it up just real quick. I think it's, sometimes it's just funny how people equate like their social media account to their podcast, you know, or how popular they are. Because like it, one does not equal the other. I hate to tell you. No, it does not. No. You true. know, like, uh, I, like, real quick, this has happened to me twice now. Once with the, uh, the Twitter account that I used to have, I made a Trump post that went over half a million. I racked in over a thousand fucking new accounts from that. Followers. That did not, I can tell you, I don't think I saw a 5% difference in the podcast views. Those people yeah. have no idea who the hell I am. Right. I just posted something they liked and they followed me. I just mm -hmm. did that recently now. I don't know how. I, you know, I wish these <laughs> posts would happen for the show, but I posted some dumb shit from Weird Al talking about, you know, conspiracies and stuff. That shit's at almost a half a million, again, views on Instagram now. I racked in over a 1,000 people from that. I guarantee you maybe five might figure out I have a podcast. Yeah. That shit doesn't matter. That's why I thought it was so funny when this kid acted <laughs> like a baby and turned off the shit. I'm like, yo, you think maybe a 1,000 people even know? We have a podcast on there, my man. <laughs> like, come on. So it's just like, it's just funny how with like even social media sometimes like it's, I, I think it's more entertaining to watch or it's convenient to get a touch with other shows. But like, it's such yeah. a shit show. I would not, you know, and plus like what I'm saying, like you can't like just because of what your uh, numbers show on there does not equal. Because I know not. people, I know people with gigantic shows that actually don't have many followers at all. That's right. And then they assume, they then they assume I'm a bigger there, yeah. show than them because I have like 7,000 followers. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. half of those people think that I'm a Trump fan because I got Patriot and they don't see my posts and they haven't stopped following me yet. Like, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. It really doesn't necessarily equate to improving your business, whatever no. your business is. So you can have 200 followers and have a very successful business or podcast or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you can have 20,000 and not have a lot of success financially or, you know, visibility wise or whatever. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how we got off on that, but all right. <laughs> Sorry. Let me wrap this up. Yeah, no, you should, you should join Twitter. It's, it's a shit show. Just in conclusion, I will. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, and then the thing is when you when I go live with you at all, I could always tag your show and you'll get tagged in live and True. stuff on Twitter. So. There we go. Yes. Yeah, and that Thanks. I do actually <laughs> have to say, I mean, it could be two-minute views, but that I actually do well with the views on Twitter. I don't you know, because oh. it will tell you how many people watched it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's why I do go live on there as well. In case people don't know, I do go live on Twitter. And uh, the new Twitter link is in the bottom, so check that out as well. <laughs> and that is the end of another uh, NY Patriot, I guess, uh, one of the weird occult uh, true crime episodes. Uh, like I said before, I do enjoy true crime, and if someone's able to come on and present any stuff that you think would fit my show, get in touch with me. You know, if, you're, uh, if you can speak as well as me or just a little bit better. Uh, that would be great, and you can cover it to true crime. I'm totally down for it, you know, especially with any, really, any other topic, and I always say that, especially to the listeners and the fans and the people in Element, you know, for real. Like, if there's stuff that fit this channel and you're capable of coming on and doing a show, don't feel stupid reaching out. You'll be doing me a favor. <laughs> you, know? you know, and it's cool to be able to have somebody that come on, like, even, like, like Nick's right now. Was a fan of the show, listener of the show, now is on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, reach out if you got anything that you think you can uh, bring on to the show. I'll be down for it. And uh, until the next one, everybody be well. Later.